We come to one of these topics this morning that is a serious topic. It's a somber, sobering topic. And I pray that you would be instructed and encouraged, comforted, challenged. Because we're talking about a, a topic that concerns really all of us in one way or another. And as I was thinking about this topic this morning, and as we come to John 13, and we continue in John 13 this morning, I was reminded of Sir Martin Frostbisher, the English explorer. And in 1575, he went to try to find the Northwest Passage, which was a northern passage around the North American continent into the Pacific. And he, he had a little bit of a journey with just one ship and found some interesting prospects. And he brought back some ore that when tested had the highest concentration of gold that had ever been found. So naturally people were excited. And so in 1577, he left England with three ships and he traveled what to, is today called Frobisher Bay in Canada and he loaded up 200 tons of this ore and he brought it back to England. The ore was analyzed and looked even more promising and everyone got even more excited even Queen Elizabeth donated to a second expedition that included 15 ships. So they weren't playing around this time. And they brought back 1,350 tons this time. And people were wildly rejoicing. Well, the smithies began to work on this ore. And they worked, and they worked, and they worked. And rejoicing quickly became bitter appointment for what he had brought back that looked so promising was nothing more than iron pyrite. Everyone had been fooled by what we now call fool's gold. It looked like gold. The initial testing said it was gold and people wanted to believe it was gold, but the reality that it was not gold. No matter what it looked like on the outside, its inner composition was truly not gold. And this happens really in the church as well. The longer you live as a Christian, the more you will see people claim to be Christ affect the faith. They will apostatize. And they will leave. You see, these people will use church words. They will sit in congregation for years. And then one day, they will be gone. They will be engaged in ministry work. They will be sharing the gospel with you. They'll be in home groups. They'll claim to love the Lord. They'll spout theological concepts. And then, in some time of trial or trouble, the rubber will meet the road. And they'll leave. And they'll abandon the faith that they claim that was theirs. The initial excitement that they have, or they had at the beginning, will fade over time. And their love for this world will be evident. Many will fall into moral sin and they'll embrace that sin and they'll reject any attempts at reproof and will not desire repentance and they will continue on a path of apostasy. They will go apostate. And I'm not talking, by the way, when we talk about apostasy of falling into sin. Paul even mentions in Romans 7, it should be a comfort and an encouragement to you that, that even the Apostle Paul struggled with the flesh. Because the more we grow in our knowledge of God and understand His character and nature, the more we all see our own sinfulness that remains. 
And the heart is desperately wicked. And it takes the Word of God to sanctify our hearts. We're not talking about falling. People fall from time to time. Apostasy is that final rejection. The willful rejection of the gospel, the hostility to Christ, and the refusal to submit to His Lordship and embrace the truth. We're coming this morning to the most famous defector of all time, Judas Iscariot. The prototype for all other apostates. No one has experienced more privileges than Judas. Judas was with Jesus personally for three years and still walked away. And Hebrews 6 says that there's no longer any hope for those that walk away. Only judgment and fire. And today we're going to be looking at this passage and we're going to be looking at the sad, sad story of Judas. Because after three years with Jesus, his part in this gospel tale of John is coming to an end. But I entitled my message this morning, The False Disciple. The False Disciple. In our account, we're going to be looking at John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. And I want to dig in and, and pull out some principles from this first apostate so that you can take these principles and you can apply them to your lives. These are principles that we're going to look at where first of all is God is not surprised and you shouldn't be either. Second principle is an unbelieving heart can be amassed by external piety. And the third point is Jesus' patient love is an example for us all. Let's go ahead and look at the text this morning. We're going to be looking at John chapter 13. Verses 18 through 30. <clears throat> I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture might be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And from now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you. He who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And Jesus said these, sorry, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and tested. Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. And the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And so Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. And he, leaning back, thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. And therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now no, no one of the, those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing that Judas had, was supposing because Judas had a money box, that he was saying to him, Buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. So the first principle I want you to see this morning is that God is not surprised at apostates. God is not surprised, and you shouldn't be as well. You should be either. Because Jesus starts out in verse 18 with a prophecy to come. He says earlier in verse 17 that if you do the things, right? If you, if you do these things, if you serve each other in love, it demonstrates your, what? Your heart. And you're blessed. And then in verse 18, he says, well, let me draw a contrast between the blessed one and the cursed one. He said, but I know the ones I have chosen. 
Now, Jesus chose all of these disciples, including Judas. He chose Judas, and selecting Judas was no accident. This was part of the plan, the predetermined plan of God. Right? But in the fact that Judas was chosen, God was going to use his treachery to achieve his purpose. And that purpose was the cross. Now, Judas is morally responsible for his sin and his choices. He was culpable. He was not an innocent bystander when Satan entered him. Judas loved power. He loved money. Over in John chapter 12, verse 6, if you remember, when Mary anoints Jesus, what does Judas do? He objects. Verse 6, John gives us this insight. It said he was a thief. He pilfered the money box. Judas was a lover of money. He was a sensual person. He wanted power. He wanted position. Judas is responsible for his choices, even though he was selected by Christ. And Christ knew all along. In fact, in, fact, in John chapter 10, 17, Jesus said he's the son of perdition, one destined for wrath. Luke 22, 22. For the Son of Man, for as the Son of Man goes, it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. See, Judas would not repent. He loved his sin. He was blind to Jesus, even though Jesus was in his midst. Judas was morally responsible. In fact, he felt that responsibility, that moral guilt. And in his despair, he committed suicide. Just like Pharaoh, Judas was to be used by God for his purposes and his glory. So Judas was chosen. But here I want you to see the prophecy. This is not a surprise. Jesus, Jesus quotes Psalm 41.9. And Psalm 41.9, the, the complete verse says, Even my close friend in whom I have trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now this passage had a historical significance in that David is speaking about the rebellion of Absalom when Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grand father joined in the rebellion against King David, a trusted advisor. And so David's speaking of historical reality, and, but Jesus says that this is also a, refers to me. He applied it to himself. You see, Jesus is telling his disciples this this is the night before he, he was to be murdered on the cross. He's telling him, look, I want you to know these things that they're even prophesied in Scripture that, that this is part of the predetermined plan of God that, that I am not caught unawares. I know what's happening. Even in Acts 1, Peter, when he's speaking to the brethren, he, he talks about Jesus. And he remembers what Jesus has said. He said, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren and said, the brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in the ministry. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and no one dwell in it. And let another man take his office. So Peter remembers Jesus' words and said, look, all this is part of the, the plan of God. It's foretold in Scripture. But Jesus relates this. And he's not surprised and he relates this for a specific purpose back in John 13. He says from verse 19, I'm telling you these things before it comes to pass. He's trying to strengthen their faith. He knows prophecy. He knows Judas's heart. He knows what's going to happen. And when it happens, they're dismayed and distraught and depressed. And Jesus wants their faith to not fail. That's what he prays for them in John 17. He wants their faith to endure. Even in the midst of 
of this great and surprising betrayal of Judas. And then he adds this statement in verse 20 that if you first read it, it looks out of place. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives, whomever I send, receives me, and who receives me, receives him who sent me. When you first read that, it seems like, that seems like an odd thing for Jesus to say. But when you look at it in the context of Judas's betrayal and his apostatizing and leaving the twelve and leaving Jesus, it, what Jesus is saying is that the betrayer doesn't diminish the mission I have given you to preach the gospel. Like, when you go, he who receives me receives him who sinned, and whoever I sin receives me. He's talking about the mission that they had been getting that will continue. Jesus knows the cross is going to succeed, and he knows Judas is going to betray him, even though they don't know that fully and understand it completely. I knew a guy in uni when I was in uni, claimed to be a Christian. Love the Lord, he said. Right? Would go to church. Would do evangelistic ministry activities with me and other guys. And would share the gospel. I had this great understanding of the gospel. He would share the gospel with people. Then one day he walked away. He said, I don't believe any of that stuff anymore. I want to indulge in the flesh. Right? Is it a case of he lost his salvation or he gave up his salvation? No, true believers will persevere, right? It was a case that all along it was head knowledge for him. He was a Judas and he went apostate and he made his choice. Did God use him? God used his word. So Jesus wasn't surprised, both pointing out to his disciples that this was predicted in the Old Testament he knew what was going to happen with the, concerning the betrayal and the apostasy of Judas. Jesus knows men's hearts. John chapter 2, and he knew Judas' heart. Judas's actions, while done in his own will, according to his own lust, were part of God's sovereign plan, all leading to the cross. So when it comes to people leaving the fellowship, we shouldn't be surprised. Most of you have heard this verse before. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown, as divinely shown, it would be shown that they are all not of us. Right? It's sad. This is a sad and sober reality that the people who are in our midst, who fellowship with us, who understand the truth, will reject the truth and reject Christ, and they will leave the fellowship. And the longer you live as a Christian, you will see this happen. And it is a saddening, and it's a heartbreaking, heart-wrenching event when it takes place. Think about the parable of the soils in Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. And Jesus explains that some are hear the, hear the word and they're excited. Verse 13, right? To them, it's like a good times, rock and roll religion. I, I'm excited. I like religious things, right? This is cool. This is great, right? Learning all this theology is cool. This is all new to me, this whole Christianese. I'm learning the words to say. And what, the justification, that's a good word. I'm taking that one, right? They learn all these church words. They're having a good time. Jesus says that when affliction and temptation arises, what do they do? They abandon the faith because the cost is too high. 1 John chapter 2, John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If, the, if the, anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Right? They, they love the world. They're, they're enticed. They, they want the good stuff of the world and they want it more than they want Christ. It's part of the parable of the soils so when preaching and they can be excited for a little while. And then that excitement fades and there's nothing left. And they realize this isn't what they really want. And then there's others. There's others where... It's interesting, it says that the, the seed goes out. It says the worries of the world and the greediness of their hearts slowly grow in their hearts, in their lives. 
and they bear no fruit. There are those that will remain in the fellowship for years. And they enjoy the, the love. They enjoy the, 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 the great fellowship that we have, but yet worldliness, bitterness, unbelief is it's all that's produced in their lives. And they don't bear fruit. And they sit in the pews year after year after year. And they have a hard, unbelieving heart. They may leave or they may not. But they're apostate. They've rejected Christ. You see, time goes by. People will leave this fellowship. And just as Jesus informs his disciples so that they would not be surprised, so their faith would not fail, then they would question the sovereign purposes of God and their faith will be strengthened. He wants them to, to understand that God's not surprised. And I want you to understand, brother, that you shouldn't be surprised. Brothers and sisters, people will leave. They will choose this world over Christ. I've seen it happen so many times over the years. And if you haven't, you will see it sometime in your life. But not only should you not be surprised, but I want you to see that an unbelieving heart can be masked by external piety. Look at verse 21. Jesus said this. He became troubled, troubled in his spirit. And he testified. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. I want you to see that Jesus had a troubled heart. The word trouble is to, to stir up deeply, have mixed emotions. Right? Why was Jesus troubled? Not only, he's not troubled by the cross. He says that earlier in, in chapter 12. He's troubled about the betrayer, about Judas specifically here. Jesus, you look at things for, from this perspective. When it comes to Judas, Judas had spent three years with Jesus. Three years. He heard the word of God from the word of God. He heard the truth daily. He saw Jesus' perfect life, his perfect love, his perfect ministry. He saw miracle after miracle after miracle firsthand. He experienced Jesus' love for him and his care firsthand. He had the privilege in Matthew 13 and others where, where Jesus, where he would tell a parable to the crowd and then he would give the private meaning to his disciples. And guess who was there? Judas. Judas got the explanation. Judas did ministry work. Right? Jesus divided up all the disciples and he sent them out two by two to preach repentance. It says that they cast out demons and they did miracles in Jesus' name. Judas could have been doing one of those things. He could have been casting out demons and, and doing miracles and he's preaching repentance. And remember what happened just recently. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Can you imagine? Judas has already gone to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders and got the, the 30 pieces of silver. He may even have them in his pocket. And Jesus is washing his feet and he's looking up at Judas in the eyes. Can you imagine the burning in Judas' heart? Judas also saw the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. He saw all these things. But Judas had a hard heart. A heart that we said earlier in John 12, 6. A heart that desired wealth and power. Colossians 3, 5, that says a, a greedy heart is an idolatrous heart. Judas was an idolater. In the presence of Christ, all he wanted was money and power. Most likely, he joined Jesus. Really, all the disciples joined Jesus initially because they, they, they believed that the kingdom, physical kingdom, was coming and they could all be a part and reap the benefits. You see, John, you see, sorry, you see, um, James and John's mother asked Jesus, hey, when your kingdom comes, can my son sit on your right and left hand? Right? They're even arguing, we talked about this last week, even arguing around the table about who's going to be greatest and who's the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus rebukes them with his act of service. 
spoke about this last week. But sometime or another, Judas became disillusioned. Right? Things weren't panning out. And Jesus wasn't talking like the Messiah that Judas, that Judas wanted and expected. And when, he, when Jesus didn't meet Judas' expectations, he became embittered and angry and further hardened his unbelieving heart. So when it comes to the Word of God, the Word of God hardens or softens. Right? It hardens or softens. The Word of God is a sharp, two-edged sword that softens and hardens, comforts and afflicts and saves and damns. On that quote in one of the commentaries I was reading. You see, now when it comes to Satan, when it comes to Judas and Satan, that their wheels aligned. Judas had for three years been rejecting truth, been rejecting salvation. He had gone to the Jewish leaders for, and got money for betraying Jesus. He wasn't an innocent man. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he willed to do it. And his will aligned with Satan. He'd been deceived by him, and Satan ended up indwelling him and using him. Sinful passions dominated his mind. In his life. Ephesians 2, by the way, says this. That's how we all were, by the way. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We were dominated by our sinful passions. We indulged in the passions of the mind and of the flesh. Judas is, we're just like Judas in that sense, right? But yet, God is rich in his mercy, saved us, regenerated us. Jesus also, not only did he know. Judas's Judas's heart, but he also knew about the consequences of sin. He's troubled because he knows the hearts of all men. And you think about this. You reckon the Son of God could understand the judgment fully that awaited Judas? Right? The horrors of the lake of fire originally prepared for Satan and his demons? Matthew 25, 41, a lake of fire, which is a, a fire and a heat, a burning that doesn't consume, an eternal thirst, a loneliness, the pain, the darkness away from the mercy and blessing of God forever. I reckon Jesus could understand those and knew what was coming for Judas. He created the lake of fire. You see, Jesus was troubled. And what did he do in verse 21? He announced it to the group. Right? His concern, even though he's troubled about Judas, his concern is for his sheep. He knows that Judas' defection will shake them to the core. The betrayal doesn't come from a, a mild associate. It comes from one of the twelve who's with Jesus. When they're actually called the Twelve. They were his special group. Jesus is troubled by betrayal. Someone loved by, or someone he loved, someone he served, had been with him for three years. See, Jesus was troubled. Troubled over Judas' hypocrisy, his sin, and his concern drives him to announce that the betrayer is even in the room. You see, Judas had, Judas had masked his unbelieving hearts. Right? They served together. They were a band of brothers. They lived together. And Judas, Judas wore that mask well. He wasn't a believer. But look at verse 22. The disciples began looking at one another, and they're at a, a loss to know of who or which one he was speaking. Right? They're looking around. <clears throat> they don't suspect Judas at all. Think about that for a second. They don't suspect Judas. He didn't walk around with a big A for apostate or B for betrayer on his back. He walked the walk. He talked the talk. They looked around. They're confused. We get a little more detail in Matthew, Matthew 26. Look over to Matthew 26 with me. I don't like, I don't usually like going to other gospels because I like to 
follow along John's thought, but I think this is important to understand when you go to Matthew chapter 13. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Matthew 26. Just making a passage. Matthew 26, verse 20. Same, same time, by the way. Well, all the things we're talking about, John 13, same time. And when the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with his 12 disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, right? They were sad. They were upset. They each began to do what? Surely not I. And notice it says, each one. Each one of the disciples looked at Jesus and says, Is it me? Is it me? Right? They're all asking him the question, is it me? Like they knew they were sinners, right? They knew they were fallible. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Am I, they're all asking, is it me? Am I self-deceived? Am I going to be the one that's going to betray you to a man? And Jesus answered, he who dipped in with me in the bowl is the one who betrayed me. And then Jesus mounts this great woe. The Son of Man is to go, but it is written of him, but woe to the man whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, keeping up this air of hypocrisy, right? he looks over and he says, Surely is it not I, Rabbi? And you have said it yourself. They're all asking the question. Judas had him fooled. Right? He's false. Since you're in Matthew, flip over to Matthew chapter 13. Really quickly here. Most of you know this particular passage. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 24. The wheat and the tares. Jesus presented another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and they went away. And when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, so the tares became evident. The slaves of the landover came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? And how come it has tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up. We gather the wheat into my barn. <coughs> you can't always see the tares is the point. Right? Some will remain in the church for years and years and years, and it will only be at the coming judgment that it will be evident. They blend in. For some, their lust and their passions are revealed. Some, their outright rejection and this reveals who they are, their contentious nature. Some will make it all the way to judgment. That's what Peter does, right? They still don't know. They, still, they don't have a clue. They don't know it's Judas. Right? He's masked. Right? He's lived among them. They couldn't tell. Peter, Peter and John, right? They both don't know. Peter looks at him, looks, at, looks over at John. Verse 23, there was one of the Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's the one who Jesus loved. He's talking about John. John says this in humility. And so Simon Peter, verse 24, gestured and says, tell us, quiet, tell us it is, who it is that he's speaking. Ask him. Because in those meals, one thing I want you to see in those meals, Passover, they would have a low table. And they're all sitting on couches and pillows and they're, they're leaning. Right? They, kind of, they kind of lean like this. Now, John is on Jesus' right, so he's leaning, and, and you know, he's kind of leaning, he's right about Jesus' hip. So he also asks Jesus a question, he can just kind of lean back like this, and hey, Jesus. Right? So Peter, Peter gestures to John, because Peter wants to know, right? but he wants him to ask quietly. Find out who it is. Who is it, John? Find out. A little whisper, a little signal. What does John do? John leans back. Lord, Lord, who is it? They didn't know. You see, religious activity when it comes to Jesus, Judas was, was all he was doing. It was outward. It was external. He probably had great prayers. He was a great servant. He was trusted by them all. He held the money bag.
You see, true Christian maturity when it comes to true believers is demonstrated in our actions of faith. A love for Christ, a love for His people, the church, and a love for His Word. Right? Are these things evident in your life? Is there, is there fruit? Is there increasing hope? Increasing joy? And increasing love? These things weren't evident in Judas' life, but he, but he hid it. He hid it well. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to test yourself, you see if you're in the faith. He, he says this to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were the boneheaded church of the New Testament. Right? He's, he says here in, in 2 Corinthians 13, I've written you three times. Three times. And he goes on to say, why haven't you repented yet? I don't want to come to you and be harsh. You need to repent now so that when I get there, we can do other things instead of me having to keep confronting your sin. And the rebellion, by the way, in 2 Corinthians, they questioned Paul's apostleship after he, they got the letter of 1 Corinthians. Imagine that. You get a letter from the Apostle Paul trying to help you correct your behavior, and you send him back a letter saying, who are you to correct us? Even though Acts chapter 18 says Paul was the one who actually established that church and led them all mostly to Christ. So Paul says, test yourself to see if you're even in the faith. Well, that's also a good admonishment to us as well. Test yourselves. Right? Are you putting off sin, strife, anger, slanders, gossip, arrogance, impurity? Are you embracing a loving humility, sorry, a humble love of Christ and his people? Are you masking it like Jesus right? with piety, religious works, good language? The third and final point I want you to see this morning is Jesus' patient love. Jesus' patient love is an example. Look in verse 26. And Jesus answered, The one who had dipped the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot. Excuse me. <coughs> so remember, Jesus had shown Judas love and grace for three years. All along, Jesus, Jesus knew what was in Judas's heart. Don't forget that. Judas was a goat. He wasn't a sheep. Jesus knew it was a facade. He knew it was religious fakery. Even the disciples didn't. Why didn't Jesus unmask him? Why didn't Jesus say anything? Because God is patient. He doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Right? 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slow about His promise. By the way, that's a promise of judgment. God is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's an act of God's love that God hasn't come, that Christ hasn't returned and judged the world. It's an act of love. That's why God, that's why, that's why Jesus didn't unmask Judas for three years. He loved him. He taught him. He discipled him. But well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus didn't treat Judas any different than any one of his other disciples. Because at any moment, if he had treated Judas different, they would have been able to say, why? Oh, yeah, we know it's Judas. You've been kind of, you know, keeping him, slighting him all these years. We, we saw that. Jesus didn't treat him any different. He showed him love and he showed him grace. And it gets even harder for Judas as well. Verse 26, when Jesus dipped the morsel, right? Judas was nearby. John was on the right. Judas was on the left. When you're sitting in a banquet like that, the person on your left is the guest of honor. Right? By Christ's own ordination, Judas was sitting in the honored spot. And it's, it's an honor. Right? If you want to honor someone, you, you dip them the, the, the choicest, meaty little morsel of meat, and, and you give it to them. Jesus is showing Judas 
the, the greatest honor, public honor that he could in front of everyone. That's one of the reasons they, they didn't suspect Judas. Jesus is showing him one last, one last example of, of love and grace. And Jesus even knew. He knew they had already been to the Jewish leaders. Like I said earlier, he probably had the 30 pieces of silver in his money bag in his pocket. What did, what did Judas do? Do you remember? What, what did Judas say? Matthew 26, 25, as Jesus was giving him the morsel, Jesus, Judas looked at Judas and surely it is not I, Rabbi. At this moment of this last bit of love of Christ to Judas, Judas keeps up the facade of hypocrisy and further hardens his heart against Christ. His heart was a stone of unbelief. He hardened his heart. He embraced his sin. Look in verse 27. What did, what did Jesus do? Well, well, sorry, first of all, what did Satan do? Satan entered into Judas, right? Judas's heart of unbelief was hardened. His will and his hatred of Christ was complete. Satan saw an opportunity. And immediately when Satan entered, what did Jesus say? What you do, do quickly. This is a command, by the way. Jesus commanded Judas slash Satan to leave immediately. By the way, right after this, Jesus establishes communion, the Lord's Supper, among his people. You see, Jesus is done. That's it. Jesus is done. No more love. No more grace. The only thing awaiting Judas is judgment. Look in verse 30. And what happens? Of course, Judas slash Satan obeys. Who can resist the commands of the word of God? He went out immediately and it was night. It was night not only physically, but it was eternal night for Judas. Having rejected the light, rejecting Jesus. Disciples, once again, it shows that they were unaware other than now John and Peter. And they're all questioning. They, they see Judas leave. And remember, he's the guest. And it shows how completely Judas had him fooled that, that they think, oh, he's going to go buy some things for the feast. Right? The Feast of Unleavened Bread continued for seven days. And the next day was when the, the uh, Judeans celebrated the Passover. And the next day after that was the Sabbath. So it's naturally we need to get some supplies. Or, or it was common to go give alms to the poor. So they, they have all reason Judas is leaving. There, there's natural good excuses this is Christ's rejection. But brethren, when it comes to us, we, we demonstrate our love for Christ by His love for his, his saints. We must be consistent and unbiased when it comes to our love. We don't know. We don't know who's faking it, who's apostate. You love them. Just like you love everyone else, you're consistent. Right? Now, that doesn't mean we don't help people. We don't speak the truth in love. We hold people accountable when they gossip, right? When they're prideful, when they're impure. We help them, right? The church's main, what the main function is, is discipleship. Ephesians 4, gifted leaders, right? God's gifted the church leaders, elders to teach. And we teach to equip you so that you can serve each other. And you can disciple each other, Right? I'm discipling you now. Preaching. Home groups is discipleship. FOF training. Discipleship. Women's ministry. Men's ministry. Discipleship. One-on-one training is discipleship. You would become what? More like Christ. A more mature disciple. That's what we're to do. We follow Matthew 18. One thing about Matthew 18 is that final step. Someone who, who resists discipleship who loves the world, right? What do we do? We, we, we go individually. We take another person. We bring him for the elders. And then what do we do? Well, we, as a church, we bring him for the church. And what are we to treat them? We're to treat them like an unbeliever. Christ identifies that they're, they've gone apostate. We don't really know. 
we never will know who's a believer and who's not. True believers persevere to the end. Some will remain in this fellowship and will be tares, and Christ will ultimately reveal it to us. It goes back to John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciple. There's no way to prevent an apostate, by the way. If a willful person comes into the church with wrong motives, information and education aren't going to be enough. I've known plenty of apostates that have great theology. But we can mitigate self-deception by making sure we get the gospel right. right? The gospel call, we emphasize the truth and necessity of repentance of confession of sin, agreeing with God that, that you're a sinner. The gospel, right? And if you're a sinner, then you're under His wrath by your very nature. And the only hope for you is what? To fall on your knees and beat your breast. Lord, I am a sinner. Save me through the precious blood of Jesus Christ who died on a cross for my sin. We preach the gospel. If any man will come after me, he'll deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's what Jesus has said. It's a life commitment. You see, apostasy is the, is the final rejection of an unbelieving heart. When it comes to apostates, if they didn't repent and believe when they had access to all the truth, they didn't repent and believe and have access to the, the fellowship of the saints. There's nowhere else to go. There's nothing else for them to learn. Like I have a friend that I loved dearly who has apostatized. I was with him in seminary. We used to have discussions. We used to combatively argue and Enjoyed each other's company. My heart grieves. My heart grieves for his family. Because he's been drawn into error. He's embraced error as truth and rejected the true gospel. All along, his heart was masked. And looking back, I can, I can think about glimpses of pride and worldliness in his life. Refusal to submit to the truth. Always wanting to question and argue and never learn and submit. And when I think about him, I, I pray. I pray for his wife. I pray for his kids who have been led into that error by their father. And I pray that they will see the truth and they'll be saved. But there's, there's nothing left. My friend has chosen his path. He's apostatized. And the only thing that awaits him is darkness and judgment. That's a sad and sobering thought. You see, apostasy for him is the, is the rejection that began a long time ago. The unbelief that was always in his heart. He knew the truth and he's walked away. I know we're going a little long, but turn me to Hebrews chapter 6. Because I know I'm going to get some questions. I want you guys to be fully informed. Hebrews chapter 6, <coughs> verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Right? This is Judas. Right? Judas had his mind enlightened. He tasted of the, the gift of grace. Right? He saw the work of the Holy Spirit. He tasted of the good word. He saw Jesus' miracles. And he walked away from the truth. And there was no longer any hope for Judas. 
When we look at this passage, this isn't believers. If you're a believer here today, I want you to be encouraged, Romans 8, 39, that nothing can take you out of God's hand, not even yourself. Author of Hebrews is here, is talking to, to people who are in the church but are not believers. They have the mental understanding, but they haven't made that, that personal heart commitment. If you're a believer and you have increasing joy and peace, and ass- then you should be assured How do you respond to trials? How do you respond to to heartbreaking trials in your life and those reoccurring temptations? Do you walk away from the faith? If you don't, be be reassured. You have a love for Christ, a love for His people, a love for His Word. Doesn't mean you won't struggle with sin. By the way, there's one other thing I, I think I need to address. I know this question. Pastor, you're going, but what about our kids that go astray? What about the prodigal son? Well, there's a difference between a prodigal and an apostatizer. Right? A prodigal falls into sin. Right? He falls into sin, but there isn't that complete, utter rejection of Christ. There, there isn't that, I'm rejecting the truth totally. That complete break. And ultimately, they respond. They respond to believers coming after them and calling them to repentance, and they repent. This apostatizer is the one that, that makes that final break with Christ, rejects the truth, and embraces error. I'd like to read this to you. Bear with me. I know we're going a little long, and I do apologize. It's a somber topic, and... I've got a couple more minutes. I was reading a, reading a sermon of John Piper. As most of you know John Piper. And he was talking about apostasy. And he made this great personal application that, that I think is so powerful. I'd like to read it to you. And he says, look, I, this is, quote, I'll be very personal. I'll give it to you at the sharpest point. If, and this is talking about himself, if in the coming years I commit to apostasy and I fall away from Christ, it will not be because I have tasted, not tasted of the Word of God and of the Spirit and the miracles of God. But over the next 10 or 20 years, he says, if John Piper begins to cool off spiritually and lose interest in spiritual things and become more fascinated with making money and writing Christ looks books, If I buy the lie that a new wife would be exhilarating and that the children can fend for themselves and that the church of Christ is a drag and that the incarnation is a myth and that there is one life to live, so let us eat, drink, and be merry. If that happens, then know the truth is this, that John Piper was mightily deceived in the first 50 years of his life. His faith was an alien vestige of his father's joy. His fidelity to his wife was a temporary passion and compliance with social pressure. The fatherhood was an outworking of natural instincts, and his preaching was driven by the love of words and crowds, and his writing was a love affair with fame. Right? Brothers and sisters, when it comes to apostasy, examine yourself. Right? Do you believe in Christ? Right? Do you find joy in Him? Do you find joy with His people? Do you find joy in the Word? Right? Or is it just merely religious exercise? Is it merely tradition? Social pressure? Right? Is it a true love for Christ that will endure to the end? Examine yourself. It's time for for that for you, for each one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your your word. Lord, this is a sober, somber topic in which we see in the life of Judas, someone who had three years of personal interaction with you and yet would not believe. Did much ministry in your, your name. Showed much fellowship with the disciples. And yet, over and over, he rejected your love. Rejected the truth. Father, you know hearts. You know those in here that may be 
apostates themselves that, that may have an unbelieving heart and are just going through the motions. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help them to see their unbelieving heart, that you would convict them, that they would, they would understand that while they sit under the truth, they are held accountable for it, that they would repent and believe before that final rejection. And there's no hope left, nothing but darkness and fire and judgment. Lord, I pray for those that are here that don't know you, that you would work in their hearts to convict them of the truth, that they may see the joy that is service to you and love for you. Father, we thank you again for the example that you've given us in your word. I pray that we would live lives glorifying to you, persevering to the end. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.